I think there's a growing recognition that when uh, emission permanently enters the atmosphere, we need to permanently remove it. So there'll be a trend over time towards um, uh, high durability removals um, to deal with residual emissions. And that's the replacement that I think we'll see um, uh, uh, that we're seeing happening now. And <laughs> to be clear, because we're talking about direct air capture and sequestration, that's where we sit. High durability. Welcome to Sustainability in the Air, the world's first podcast dedicated to sustainable aviation. I'm your host, Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simply Flying. Every Thursday, I have important conversations with top aviation executives, technology entrepreneurs, and policymakers helping aviation take climate action. Conversations that help separate the signal from the noise. Whether you are a frequent flyer or an airline executive, if you care about sustainability or simply love traveling, welcome aboard. This season of Sustainability in the Air is brought to you by Travelport. Travelport is a global technology firm that powers bookings for hundreds of thousands of travel suppliers worldwide. The company's travel retailing marketplace, Travelport Plus, helps retailers understand and communicate the most sustainable options. When it comes to sustainability in travel, it can be difficult for travelers and agents to identify which flights, routes, and accommodations are the greenest. That's why Travelport empowers its agents to operate as modern retailers of sustainable travel, giving them the ability to access consistent emissions data using the travel impact model. Travelport is also exploring solutions to help travel retailers offer carbon compensation and nature regeneration to their customers. My guest today is Amy Rudock. Amy leads the carbon engineering business in Europe and Middle East. Carbon engineering, for those you may be familiar with, is a leader in carbon capture and turning it into sustainable aviation fuel. In fact, this Squamish BC-based company has recently been bought by Occidental Petroleum. That's how huge the potential is. Now, Amy herself has a PhD in electrochemistry. She is the real deal here. She is ex-BCG and used to head up sustainability at Virgin Atlantic before taking up the role at Carbon Engineering. Amy and I geek out today live in person from Paddington, London. We discuss everything from carbon capture to carbon storage to scaling staff. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Amy, it's great to be speaking in person here in London on the canal. Hopefully it's not too <laughs> rocky. Uh, but up until some time back, I was based in British Columbia. And one of the big success stories in British Columbia out of Squamish is um, carbon engineering. You are, of course, with carbon engineering. And I've been keen to feature carbon engineering for a while. But for those who are unaware, what is carbon engineering? And what do you personally do here at Carbon Engineering? Yeah, I have to say that what a beautiful location and thank you for having me. And also what a beautiful location that you're from as well. British Columbia is absolutely stunning. Um, carbon engineering is, as you say, based in British Columbia. Um, we have a pilot and an innovation center out in Squamish, um, very close to Whistler between Vancouver and Whistler. So what we do is direct air capture and we are developing the technology for, for direct air capture. Um, that is capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And then when you have that carbon dioxide, you can either store it back safely underground and effectively reverse an emission, um, or you can use it to create drop-in compatible products. Um, carbon engineering itself has been capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere since, since 2015, which was when we first did that in our, um, in our pilot for this facility over in Squamish. And I guess you may be thinking, why would you want to do that? So I think my first answer would be, we're already at unsafe levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we need to draw that down. Um, I think of an, an, an analogy like a bathtub. If your bath is getting close to overflowing, you turn the tap off, but you'd also probably pull the plug. And what we're doing with that capturing and storing underground is like pulling the plug. Now, the interesting thing is, I remember first reading about carbon 
capture and storage uh, from journalists who were pro-oil and how oil companies were using this as a license to continue to drill oil. Of course, the sentiment has since changed to we need to, like you said, pull the plug. We need to suck carbon out while we ramp down fossil fuel consumption as well. So carbon capture has become a critical part, especially for industries that are hard to decarbonize, which brings us to aviation. What is the application that carbon engineering is looking to build towards decarbonizing aviation? So there's two applications. And I think when you look at any aviation decarbonization roadmap, um, and let's just take a snapshot in 2050, but it will ramp up to that. If you look at 2050, first of all, sustainable aviation fuel is predicted to be um, used at, at scale. And for sustainable aviation fuel, today's feedstocks are biological. They might be municipal solid waste, but that's limited. So you need a large supply of carbon. And that's something that direct air capture can give you a source of carbon from the atmosphere that can be used for those uh, synthetic uh, fuels at scale. And effectively, it's unlimited. We've got too much carbon in the atmosphere. So that's use case one. And then the second is that um, there will still be residual emissions. Whatever decarbonization pathway you're, um, you're applying, if you look at the full life cycle analysis, there will still be residual emissions. And that's when removals come in. And I was talking about once you capture the carbon dioxide and you store it back underground, you're effectively reversing an emission. So we'll be needing to balance those residual emissions with, uh, with removals. Um, and that's the second use case. And when you say removals, direct air capture, is, is direct air capture the same as carbon capture and storage? Is there a difference? In plain English, how does this actually work? So direct air capture is, is a form of carbon capture. Typically, the term carbon capture and storage is broader. So it's including also capturing um, carbon at point sources. So think about um, factories that have a, a, a stack. Maybe they're producing steel, aluminium, and they've got a point source um, of, of carbon dioxide. You can capture that at source, but what you're doing there is you're stopping more going into the atmosphere. So that's one form of carbon capture. Direct air capture is taking it from the atmosphere um, and, um, and, and is effectively reversing emissions once you're storing it. Um, so you're taking what's already out there. For the non-engineers among us, the air has lots of gases. So you're sucking in all of air, but you're only capturing carbon. What about other things like methane and water vapor, which also is emitted when an airplane flies? Can you not capture those dirty gases or things that have a warming effect on the globe as well? So our process is, is, um, is about the, the carbon capture, the carbon dioxide capture. Um, and why? Because we, we've honed the system to be optimized to, to do that. So effectively, what we're doing in our system is if you think back to high school, senior school chemistry, and you may remember the term acid plus base equals salt plus water, some of the listeners may, that's what we're doing. So within our system, we have a base, um, potassium hydroxide, and that's reacting with the acidic carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It's creating a salt, and that's effectively how, how we're doing that from the atmosphere. Um, of course, when we're looking at greenhouse gases, it's important to think about the, the other gases that you mentioned as well, methane, water, etc. But a big part of the problem is going to be that carbon dioxide. Interesting. You said you the, the output is a salt. Are you injecting the salt back in the ground? And if so, does it change the composition at all? I'm just, you know, geeking out a little here with you. <laughs> no, of course. I have to say my background is physical chemistry, chemical physics. So I also love the geeking out. Um, when I refer to a salt, um, where we have that reaction between the potassium hydroxide and the carbon dioxide, we're creating calcium carbonate. We, we do a little ion exchange. We, we, form calcium, um, we form calcium carbonates, and that calcium carbonate is, is chalk, and that, and that is a salt. Um, once you have that, we heat up the calcium carbonate, and what comes off is a very pure stream of carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide, you can turn into a supercritical liquid. So imagining it be behaving a lot like the oil that's come out of the ground, and you send it back in, into the... Um, geological storage in that in that form. 
So the salt is a step in the process. Got it. Okay. So you said you have a, a plant in Squamish. Is that what this plant is doing currently? Yeah. So over in Squamish, we uh, we have been operating a pilot facility since 2015. And then in 2021, we completed um, the construction of an innovation center. And that innovation center is testing our process. Um, it's a platform for innovation on our process um, that we uh, it, effectively that's what we're doing. But we're um, we're running we're replacing, we're, we're testing new ideas, we're innovating. It's all about getting down the cost curve for um, for that direct air capture. So let's talk about cost then. Um, my understanding is that the current cost of carbon capture and storage is anywhere from $200 a ton to $2,000 a ton based on where you're doing it and how you're doing it. What is your cost? And I believe that to make this economically viable, um, I think it needs to come down to $100 a ton. What is your cost curve looking like? When when do you think you'll get there? So it's probably worth mentioning what our business model is because um, I need to talk about our partners. Uh, we, as Carbon Engineering, are developing the technology. We're licensing that technology to a company called 1.5. 1.5 is a subsidiary of Oxy's low-carbon ventures business. And this so, is Occidental Petroleum. Yes. So 1.5 are going out and looking at deploying these facilities globally. So it's 1.5 that is out there talking about the, the cost of capture. Um, so in, in their recent analyst um, updates, they, they, they've put out some cost estimations. Um, so currently under construction in Texas is the first commercial scale facility to use our technology. Um, it's in the Permian Basin. And this facility, when, it, when it's fully operational, should be capturing 500,000 tonnes. Of, per, of per year. Per year of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, started construction expected to be operational in 2025. Now, 1.5 um, have talked about a cost of 400 to $500 per tonne um, for that first of a kind plant. Um, and then they've talked about what the cost trajectory could look like. So they've put out estimations by 2030 of being in the range of 200 to $250. And then we enter what we call manufacturing mode and then looking at getting in the kind of $125 range. And what is manufacturing mode? It's it's about bowling out these facilities, um, learning by doing, but also economies of scale and being able to create a supply chain around large, large hubs of these facilities. So, 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 so that's, so that's how you get down there. And you talked about it being economic when it's a hundred dollars per ton. Um, I think I, I, I have, I have seen that quoted. Um, I would say that Climate scientists, um, for example, through the IPCC, have talked about the need to draw down billions of tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, I would argue that when we're looking at what's economic, we should be comparing to what if we do nothing, and also comparing to what are the what are we paying today in terms of carbon pricing. And flipping it back to aviation, if I look at sustainable aviation fuels. I look at the costs of what they're selling for per litre and I back out what are we therefore paying for the carbon reduction. You get to, you get to upwards of $400, $500 per tonne. So I would say that the world today is paying a lot more than that, than that $100 per tonne. Right. So you will be cost competitive compared to other solutions. Now, thinking back, I remember hearing about 1.5 for the first time sitting uh, – with uh, Dirk Singer, our head of sustainability, at this uh, conference, press conference by Airbus at Farnborough last year, I think it was. And that's where it was mentioned that Airbus is getting into a partnership with 1.5 to develop carbon capture and, and storage solutions. And tons of airlines from EasyJet to LATAM in South America were committing to that. Tell me about that project. How far has it gone? What is the vision for this partnership with Airbus? What a fabulous conference that was. Um, I, I was at Farnborough too. I was sitting in that room. And um, I think if something's going to bring the realities of climate change to us, it's that, it's that day at Farnborough. It was 40 degrees from memory and in the UK, right? Um, so what was announced at Farnborough, um, it, it, actually slightly before Farnborough, and, and, and then there, what, there was another announcement at Farnborough, was that Airbus is, is going to offtake 400,000 tonnes um, of carbon removals from that 
plant that I was talking about that 1.5 is, is currently construction. This is 80% of your capacity for the year. Um, so the the Airbus deal looks like um, 100,000 tonnes over the course of over Got the it. course of four years. So 20% uh, over four years. So this, yeah, so that's, so that's what they announced. Um, and then in in farm and and that's committed to offtake right and I, I, I can talk about the importance of that in a minute but what what was then announced at Farnborough is that Airbus is going to partner or intends to partner with seven different airlines or airline groups ar- around that um around that offtake so Airbus is thinking about decarbonizing its own operations but also how can it partner within the aviation industry to get direct air capture going and I mean, at, at the heart of all of this interest is that understanding about the decarbonisation roadmap that I talked about. If, if, if you don't start building the facilities today, you're not going to have the supply by 2050 to meet those residual emissions or to meet that carbon supply for, for synthetic fuels. Right. I think that makes sense. This brings me uh, to a conversation I had with Dr. Patrick Gerber, who was the CEO of Jivo, a SAF mm-hmm. maker. And he talked about the importance of demand signals from the aviation industry. And that's why he's so keen on signing offtakes for the future, no matter how far in the future they are. And I'm guessing this Airbus commitment is a very strong demand signal for you. Yeah, exactly. So when we think about these projects, um, we're talking huge infrastructure projects. Um, we're talking capex of a billion or, or so, like ballpark. How, how do you fund infrastructure projects like that? Well, actually, the first project oxy oxy is is funding itself from its balance sheet but you would look towards project finance to deploy tens hundreds of these plants and what does project finance look for it looks for confirmed offtake so incredibly important and i just mentioned another one within the aviation industry that i lose track of time but let's say a week a week and a half ago um 1.5 had another announcement with ana um who are going to offtake 30,000 tons so it's all it's all about building up that offtake um, and the, the demand signals that come. So this adds up. Um, going back to one of the points, so there's strong demand signals now from mm-hmm. aviation. I remember studying for many airlines, they have their, their net zero 2050 roadmaps, you know, mm-hmm. and they have multiple pathways. There's the sustainable aviation fuel part. There's the hydrogen pathway. There's the future technologies path. And there's some in some airlines demand management and you mm-hmm. know re- rethinking that. Is carbon capture and storage one of those pathways, an individual pathway from an airline perspective? Or do you fit into existing pathways of, of SAF or hydrogen? Where do you fit in, in an airline's roadmap? So two of them. Um, within the, the sustainable aviation fuel parts, um, it, it is the future. It, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is going to be the future feedstock that is scalable. So it's, it's a sub part of that. Um, sustainable aviation fuel and then there is always a chunk that is residual emissions um, and today you have schemes like Corsia um, looking at that and I'd say that um, currently when when we're thinking about offsets there's a bunch of stuff in there, there there's avoidance credits there's reduction credits there's removal credits there's a real trend that is pushing us towards removal credits and the understanding that if you're going to put an emission into the atmosphere it needs to be removed so one plus minus one equals, equals zero so the other part direct air capture is 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 within that removals part um, interesting what does this cost to the airline and who pays for it does the airline pay for it is this something that you think will be passed on to the customer? Is this something businesses will pay the airline to ensure that their own carbon is sucked out of the air uh, for flying? They're they're very active conversations, right? I think there's some policy decisions that will um that will help answer answer that question. But I think ultimately, um, thinking about the real cost of flying, there is a carbon cost associated with it. And so over time, we will see that flowing through um, to ticket prices, um, whether it's through um, whether it's through that future generation of aircraft, whether it's through sustainable aviation fuel, whether it's through removals. Um, yeah, ultimately, the true cost of flying will flow through to um, to the revenue that's required. Right. What do you say to critics who say, oh, you know, this is like a get out of jail free card? where airlines can continue to pollute or 
business travelers can continue to do day day trips in business class as long as their carbon footprint is taken care of. What do you say to that? It, it's um so I, I I'd say that what's very important is to is to decarbonize aviation. So um what matters to the atmosphere is the the net amount of carbon dioxide that, that's in the atmosphere and and that is what we should be following so carbon in carbon out should be matched um i i think the term get out of free, free jail cards implies that something's easy i i'd say what i'm trying to do is very much not easy um there's a massive scale up operation that's that's required not just to um not just to address residual emissions in hard to abate sectors like aviation but also about those legacy emissions that 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 are already up there that I talked about um if we're to meet the need um for for these removals that climate scientists talk about we're talking about deploying thousands of these facilities over over the next couple of decades and and that is not an easy task Well, um yes, the scale of it is massive. I'm sure you would have seen the recent talk by former Vice President Al Gore, who talked who actually mentioned in his talk Occidental Petroleum, and he talked about how this is uh, how petroleum companies are using carbon capture and storage as a license to continue to drill more. Given your own close relationship with Occidental, where do you stand on this? I I can talk about what carbon engineering thought about in um in its strategic partnerships. So w- we realized that what we do very well is technology development. As a startup, we had the scientists focusing on that. What what we also were doing quite well is that kind of market creation and um going out there and talking to customers about what we do. But what we didn't have um in our skill set and our history was the ability to deploy large scale infrastructure projects these billion dollar projects i'm talking about what we didn't have was any expertise on the transportation and storage side so what do you do with that um with that carbon dioxide what we didn't have as well was the ability you know, or the the history of operating large scale chemical plants let's call them so we look for strategic partners that have that and i think throughout my career i've always thought if you're trying to do something well assemble the best team So we looked for those complementary skill sets and where does um knowledge of carbon management set like the ability to handle carbon dioxide where does um experience operating large scale chemical projects work where does comfort and ease and experience of funding billion dollar infrastructure projects sit well a lot of that is in the traditional oil and gas sector and then the devil's in the detail you want to partner with people who truly believe in this transition and to to nod to oxy itself they've talked about their transition into a, a carbon management company and a recognition that um the the unique skill sets that they bring to this transition is that history and knowledge of of um of handling carbon dioxide so yeah it's all about putting the best people on the job and you know the <laughs> the atmosphere just needs its carbon removed and um i i i think we should be celebrating any large investment that goes into doing that yeah i think you you're right i it reminds me of a conversation i had with uh adam goldstein of archer where they are partnering with stellantis which is a very large car manufacturer to get them into large scale manufacturing because they are an engineering company archer and mm-hmm. they want to scale these ev tolls and hence they are working with the large car manufacturer mm-hmm. who has done this and scaled this before so I, I totally see your point um there um something you mentioned earlier was credits mm-hmm. how carbon capture credits can be applied by airlines traditionally corsia of course uh has encouraged offsetting now of late offsetting carbon offsetting has got a bad rap do you foresee carbon capture credits replacing carbon offset credits in the future What I see replacing the term offsets is is removals, right? So the broad term offsets includes avoidance credits. Um as an example, um clean cook stoves that um you you may have heard of those those kind of credits. Um 
It also includes uh, removals that are, that are short-term durability and long-term durability. And in short-term, you might think about something like, like reforestation. I, I think there's a growing recognition that when uh, emission permanently enters the atmosphere, we need to permanently remove it. So there'll be a trend over time towards um, uh, high durability removals um, to deal with residual emissions. And that's the replacement that I think we'll see um, uh, uh, that we're seeing happening now. And <laughs> to be clear, because we're talking about direct air capture and sequestration, that's where we sit. High durability um, removals. Got it. Yeah. High quality, high durability. Yeah. Um, captured CO2, of course, is also one of the ingredients you need for e-fuels. Mm -hmm. And we've you know, often had guests here talking about the importance of e-fuels going forward. Um, what are your plans to produce synthetic aviation fuels at Carbon Engineering? Yeah, so synthetic aviation fuels, I'd say, have, have three ingredients. A carbon source, so direct air capture from the atmosphere, a source of hydrogen, um, and fuel synthesis. Um, what we're seeing today is each of those going down its cost reduction journey. So today, carbon capture from the atmosphere is, is expensive, green hydrogen is expensive, fuel synthesis, depending on what you're talking about. But anyway, they're all coming down cost reduction. So um, what we foresee in the future is uh, direct air capture hubs, where you've got a given facility that will have a stream of, of carbon dioxide captured from the atmosphere. And, and a lot of that will be going into sequestration, creating those at those removals, but some will be used for, for synthetic fuels as well. So almost a, a slipstream going off. Um, so what I would say is we think of direct air capture for removals today in order to be available for those synthetic fuels later. So any kind of investment in, in removals today is bringing direct air capture down its cost curve and reducing the cost of that carbon that will be a slipstream to synthetic fuels later. Got it. So it reduces the cost of production of synthetic aviation fuels, ultimately. Exactly. And hydrogen will be going down its own cost curve at the same time. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Um, now, you've had a very, very interesting career. You're a scientist, one of the rare scientists I've had on the show. Um, you then went to head up sustainability at Virgin Atlantic before landing your current role at Carbon Engineering, how did you end up where you are today? Yeah, um, so that, that's all true, and there's some other steps too. Um, so I, I did my PhD in um, physical chemistry, chemical physics, um, and then I left academia to become a consultant. I worked for the Boston Consulting Group for about 10 years, and I focused on the aviation sector. So I was traveling around the world, working on all aspects of aviation, from strategy to operations to revenue management, et cetera, et cetera. So I got a broad understanding of, of aviation. Um, I then moved to Virgin Atlantic, and I did have sustainability in my remit, but I was also looking after corporate strategy, government affairs, and Heathrow expansion. So I was... I was able to um, to think about how sustainability fits into the entirety of what um, that airline um, needed to achieve. Um, with the COVID pandemic, um, I, I, I co-led uh, the recapitalization of the airline, and then I then I had the opportunity to think about what what next for me. I I, I was looking at growth within an airline, and um, and you know post pandemic. Um, I wanted to follow my heart, and my heart was decarbonizing th this sector. I'd learned a lot about what that what that roadmap looks like, and it led me to think about um, sustainable aviation fuel or direct air capture. Kind of long story short, there was an opportunity at Carbon Engineering. Um, th the company realised that one of the major markets was aviation. There was also um, Based in Canada, there was nobody this side of the ocean looking at the European opportunity, so it's sort of right place at the right time. But three years later, um, almost three years later, I'm I'm here, you know, looking after Europe and the Middle East. Wow, that's such an interesting journey. You mentioned you worked on the Heathrow expansion project. Uh, would the Amy of today still support that expansion project from Amy of five years or three years ago? I I think the context was that Heathrow was going through its uh, DCO, its development consent order um, process to 
um, to get permission to to expand. And as an airline that had a huge footprint at Heathrow, it was important to be part of that that process, right? Um, and I I think balancing it with sustainability is incredibly important. If if we're going to have airport expansion, we better do it in a sustainable way. So yes. I would still make that choice. Okay. I think it's important to have that crux of that um, that trade off with one person. Absolutely, and you also mentioned Virgin Atlantic. I had Holly uh, recently on the show, and okay. she's super excited about the hundred percent SAF flight mm-hmm. uh, coming up from uh, Virgin Atlantic this year. Um, do you think that will be a watershed moment for aviation, especially in the UK? Yeah, I'm excited. Holly, uh, Holly got the leadership opportunity with us as well. Yeah, it is incredibly exciting and um, bit of a plug. I think um, it, it will be 100% staff, but they're also thinking about making it um, a net zero flights. So they're thinking about the residual emissions um, and, they're, and, and they're working, I believe, with a biochar company about which is another form of removal ab- about dealing with those residual emissions. So kudos to Holly for thinking, for, for thinking about different parts of that um, decarbonization curve. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I find it quite fascinating how carbon engineering is in Squamish with their innovation lab. They've got this plant coming up in Texas. You are here in the UK. Given you are in Europe, plus, um, and carbon engineering is um, in the US, what are the global expansion plans? Because aviation is very global. Yeah. Uh, a ton of carbon emitted down in Australia, you know, is the same as a ton of carbon emitted anywhere else. It's, it's all going to the same atmosphere. What are your global expansion plans? And can you share some of that? Yeah, I, th- I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, as soon as carbon's emit, um, emitted, it very quickly disperses around the atmosphere. So it, it doesn't matter where you capture it from. Um, emit here, capture here. And the the net balance is the same. So when we're looking at at deploying direct air capture, you're looking for where is it most effective, um, cost effective to do so. And some of the factors you'll look at is uh, what is the climate? um, Do you have storage available? Um, And um, then do you have renewable power available? Like, is it very windy? Is it very sunny, et cetera, et cetera. And that that um, pushes you towards certain locations where it would probably be the most cost effective to deploy. And that, that's the way that we look at the world. Um, so I, I think uh, specifically my remit covers Europe and the Middle East. And um, I'd say that the, the Middle East there are, um, is very promising in terms of those, those factors that I talked about. And um, I was, you know, I was racking my brains going one, two, three, and I missed the four, which is you also want the right skill set. So when I talked about um, before, like why partner with complementary industries, um, it, it helps if you have those traditional skill sets available from oil and gas as well. The carbon management, the large scale infrastructure projects, etc. So, yeah, right. that's the way we look at it. Seems like a match made in heaven uh, for this. Um, let's look into the future. I know that you've been influenced by Charles Seaman um, in his 2018 book, uh, The Wizard and the Prophet, Two Views of the Future. And maybe given give our listeners an overview of what Charles Mann meant. And given what you do, do you consider yourself a tech optimist? Do you think we can innovate our way out of this or we will need behavioral changes, including demand management or, or travel cuts? So I have to give kudos to Baz Submer here, who is a friend and an ex-colleague from BCG who recommended the book to me. I have to admit, I haven't actually read the last pages yet, but it, I, I think it's incredibly great framing of the world. Um, it, it talks about different branches of environmentalism. So fundamentally, profits are, um, they, they believe that the world is finite um, and therefore to be sustainable, um, you, you have to think about the demand you have on the world and reduce your demand on, on natural resources. Whereas wizards that think about human ingenuity and say that, you know, through, um, through innovation, we can continue to grow and we can do that in a sustainable way. I really recommend reading the book. I've, I, they, they do it through fascinating case studies. And I particularly enjoyed uh, learning about uh, fertilizer um, and the, the growth of the uh, fertilizer industry. Me, myself, I'm a bit of, I'm a bit of both. Um, I'm living and breathing in my career the wizard side of things, um, innovation in action. But I'm also a prophet. And I'm I, I, to share a few examples, food waste, it, it's shocking. And 
I I've seen various different statistics, but we're talking around ten percent of emissions could be could be reduced by just stop wasting, stop that demand, stop that consumerism around um around foods. I daily in London I look at the number of private cars and I think this is this is crazy with the public transport options available. Like we we need to we need to think about that and our and our demands. Um and you know I think I think the same does apply to air travel as well. We we need to be very conscious about every choice that we make. Um and that's that's more of a profit um profit view of the world. So wizard and profit. Interesting you mentioned food because I have to share um my recent move to London has been eye opening in so many ways. One of those is avocados. So in Canada we bought a bag of a dozen avocados every time we went there and then by the end of the week half of the avocados had gone bad and you would have used half of them you just cannot go through avocados so quickly even though my, one of my daughters really loves guacamole the other one doesn't it, you know we had an <laughs> avocado problem in our house and i used to think oh my god so much food wasted when i moved to london i was so pleasantly surprised that avocados come in a pair a green avocado and a brown one is ready and one is not i said this is how you got to do it guys let's stop wasting avocados and let's just have one and one and we've not thrown away any avocado since we moved to london for the record i i think that fits into the wizard side of the world it's a bit of innovation in business models i yeah i don't, i don't know my 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 own contribution to that demand in food is is i'm vegan and i'm a huge advocate for veganism and um Yeah. Fantastic. You yeah. you're already re- reducing your carbon footprint and this yeah. you know this segues nicely into the final part of this interview which is the rapid fire round. You already told me about a book you really like. Yeah. What's your favorite airline, Amy? I'm so conflicted to answer that. I'm ex Virgin but my husband flies the 320s for BA. Too too conflicted to answer. <laughs> All right. Okay, we will skip that and not <laughs> not put you in a doldrum there. What's your favorite city? London. You know, I travel a lot, but I love my city. Okay, favorite movie? Usual Suspects, the Kaiser Soze moment gets me every time. I have to watch it again. It's been a long time. I think I last <laughs> watched it on plane. Um, what is something you want to learn? I look back to my university days and I wish that I'd gone to some side courses on philosophy of science, but but actually probably my real answer is how to get a 4 and 6 year old to tidy their rooms. We should share notes. <laughs> we should. Um what do you do in your free time when not swimming in a pond? I a, a lot of swimming in ponds. So um I I run, I swim in ponds. I I'm recently got very into hot yoga and pilates and I spend a lot of time as a mother with that four and six year old. You you definitely do. You have your hands full. Um and uh, what's the best advice you have received? never a bad thing to be curious keep asking questions and finally if you were stuck on an 18 hour long haul flight who would you love for your seat neighbor to be oh um so many can i have more than one sure go for it i i'm really struggling here because i'm trying to narrow it down um i would love to You know what? I'm going to choose a category of people. I'm going to say I wish I would have a CEO of of an airline and probably the airline I've chosen to do the 18 hour flight on so I can talk to them about decarbonization journeys, how passionate I am and how they could make that flight net zero each day. Is there a CEO? Do you want to name a CEO? We'll send them a note and a clip of this and make sure that they're on a flight <laughs> no, with you. No, send it to them all. <laughs> any any CEO of an airline will do. All right. And airline, will an ex airline CEO work? Sure. Okay, fantastic. Because I've <laughs> I've been having conversations with many of those lately and trying to get them to this side of the world that growth needs to be balanced with sustainability and I think uh, you'd have a great time uh, talking to some of them. Yeah. Amy, this was a pleasure speaking with you in person in Likewise. London <laughs> and I do wish you all the best. You too. Thank, Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sustainability in the Air. Aviation is one of the hardest to decarbonize industries yet there are multiple paths to get to net zero awareness is key to a green future so please give us your support to help our sustainable aviation insights reach a wider audience you can do this by sharing this episode on your network on linkedin twitter or even whatsapp 
or perhaps you might consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this episode. You can start a conversation with us by writing to us at podcast at simplifying that's simply with an i dot com. And for more content on sustainable aviation, please visit our website green dot simplifying dot com and join the movement. Sustainability in the air is an original podcast by Simply Flying. The show is produced by Uri Toth in Slovakia. Dirk Singer is our director of sustainability, who leads research for each interviewee out of Greenwich, UK. Shubhadeep Pal is our supervising editor, based out of Mumbai and Singapore. The articles are written by Ayushi Badola in Dehradun in India and Mira Hull. in Montreal Quebec creative design is led by Lihia Esteve in Montreal Baiba Dreamen is the project director for the show based out of Valencia Spain special thanks to Wendy Sim in Singapore and I am Shashank Nigam the CEO of Simplifying and your host please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn